Sony also has a lot of experience in terms of partnering. The Migrant Resource Center is a really good uh, example in this last year. So there's this extensive cross-sector partnering that he's been doing. And uh, Leonard isn't here yet. I hope he comes. Um, and just this last week, breaking news, he like shifted. So he was, up until whatever, a week and a half ago, the former president CEO of Westside Development. And then this last week, he started working with Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So I don't know if we're going to see him tonight. He might be really busy because there's lots of happenings there. If he shows up, and I'm hoping he does, has had a conversation at his economic development via urban communities. And we have uh, Patty Radel. We could ask the question, how many people here already know Patty Radel? <laughs> okay. So do I need to say more community organizing and systemic change? And she has a lot of, and how long have you been living and doing this work in that spot? I've been living in this community um, for 52 years. And the show told me that he was coming late right because he had another engagement, but he's done this before, so he's just going to slide in and start talking once he gets here. But he's the guy behind Dream Week, um, so you probably know more of that from him, um, but the mighty grid visioning and bridge building uh, tolerance, e e equality, and I'm so used to doing the equity thing, equality and diversity in the community. So these are their conversation ads. Um, I'm going to ask the first question of them. And I, I really like the, the number. Oh, Sister Denise. Sorry, Sister. How could I forget the sister? I'm sorry. Uh, sister Denise Lurak uh, has the Interfaith Welcome Coalition. I don't know if you're familiar with their work, but welcoming uh, migrants, immigrants through the bus station, airport, but really a, an important component in the uh, migrant search that we had. Um, but partnering across faith lines and community lines and sectors has been her real gift. But also, I think, visioning inspiration to people. We could add that as well. So did I get everybody now, Susan? <laughs> All right. So um, we're going to do a lot of three things tonight. So um, in a, I'm going to bring up the first question. And I'm going to ask the conversation starters not to talk yet. I want you to really think about the question. I'm going to give you three minutes so that you have your answer. Because some of the things that happen when we get in conversation, we start morphing our answer. And I want your best answer so that you can share that. But while they're doing that mulling for three minutes, I'm going to invite all of you to find two other people that you've never talked to before. So you will be in threes, and you will have exactly three minutes to tell each other what you bring to this conversation. Okay? But not yet. So, here's our first question. Well, first we're going to look at, this was what came out of our first conversation in October. And there were about 10 items that kind of surfaced, but this was repeated over and over again. That we need to have explicit and intentional connected work across between all nonprofits, congregations, governmental entities, and community, which basically means everybody. Okay. To work together to collaborate. And so tonight we are specifically talking about working together, collaborating as community. What does that mean from some people who do that work? Okay, so the first question and conversation starters, just think of your answer. From your particular ad, your conversation ad, your life experience to this conversation, name one of the most essential and effective, explicit and intentional methods in bridging work across lines and sectors of community. Name one really important, essential, explicit, and intentional thing that must be done so that we can partner better across different lines of community. Does that make sense? All right, now, three minutes. Everyone else, find two people you've never talked to before. Find a spot. I'm going to time it. And you need to share with each other what you want. Thank you. 
January, do you send you what's going first? We have about two minutes. I think going first, there's no wrong answer, right? So
you know, and, and to just ask people, like, uh, we have, like, when we had all those immigrants coming, you're like, um, we need lunches, or, or we need a place during the day, or, and you just keep asking people, you know, um, do you know anybody for this? You didn't know anybody for that? And, and people help you make other connections. Um, and, and, you know, I think of how many people I've, I've just met through doing that. <laughs> things, things happen, you know, and the city comes forward and all that when we have all those people. But, you know, I just randomly left people phone messages at different churches or, or emailed them and said, hey, you know, um, we need volunteers or, you know, we need help and, you know, are you interested? Um, so, you know, how many do you get a response from? But we, we do get a lot of responses, but, but it, it comes from meeting other people, you know, and, and like you were saying, I like that point you said so much about, um, um, meet, meeting the people who need to, you know, and I think for the Interfaith Welcome Coalition, it's like, how, how do we help people who can't be there to still meet people? You know, because it's that personal connection and, and interaction. Um, I go to Nuevo Laredo once a week, and like, people don't know what's going on with the people on the other side of the border, so how, how do we help them to meet them? You know, uh, we could make contacts for to meet someone else ourselves, but, but you know, getting the letters from those from the people, well, their stories, and then trying to share that. So even though they can't meet you and say, oh, well, what do you need? I'm like, oh, gosh, your situation is really horrendous. You know, they can't hear that from you, but at, at least being, you know, a vehicle of, of helping other people meet each other, too. Thank you. Um, I think for me, it's when you bring all these organizations together, there's no sort of equals around the table. There's a lot of status around the table. And then there's also, if, if this is group work, people who have been forgotten, people who don't have a voice, people who need listened to. And so I suppose for me, the, the fundamental principle to argue for and stand for is that um, each person is a gift, not a problem. Mm -hmm. And that means that then the police officer can contribute, it means the dad can contribute, it means the young person can contribute, in a different way to only the, the ways that they think the office will allow them to do. And it also means that people in the community exercise their voice. And for me, that's just an ironclad principle. And then people become human with each other. Because if each person is of value, then each person has a voice and they can exercise their agency, their possibilities to make change. For me, that's the fundamental starting point and sticking to it. If anybody doesn't treat the other person and give them their place, you hold them accountable for that. Nothing moves until they treat them well. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think you know, that, that sense of that dignity and respect for everyone is really the basis of the whole thing. You know, because we, we, we all have our prejudices and biases. You know, um, hopefully we're not all racist. You know, but but we all have those, and there's such that lack of awareness. And you know, maybe you say something, you do something, kind of like, oh, you know, and and it's so easy to to just go with that and to judge that other person instead of thinking, well, there's a reason why you feel that way, and to to take that opportunity and ask a question. To Curious, you know, to understand where you're coming from, because obviously you have a, a reason why you you think the way you do, and you know I have, and it's not just you know I might, you know my perspective is the only one, but but I think that curiosity and, and getting to know other people and have those conversations. Um, I I really love what you said about the value of people in the territory and the value of people mentioned that your perspective. I do want to talk on having the availability to reach messaging and to find a different understanding and to see things from different facets uh, from outside of the paywall. Sometimes it's a, things being accessible uh, to information or to status or to decision makers is expensive. It's really expensive being able to buy Gala tickets, I'm going to talk from the entrepreneur point of view. Gala season just ended, I spent almost $2,000 on just being able to walk around and say hello around with some dry chicken and some rice. And <laughs> it's, 
you know, it's an expensive movement, and I see I look around rooms, and there's not a lot of people that look like me in those rooms. And I can only imagine how many women, uh, black women, women that are married to their business partners, women that own businesses, are outside of those spaces wishing and hoping for the type of access that I had because I could purchase a ticket or because I can pay for a year's supply of information from the business journal. I can put a strategy on the types of sectors and lines and communities that I can engage with. You know, there's a ton of information out there that allows people to access and the ability to partner, but then again, it's sitting behind a paywall. And we really don't know how, it's, how welcoming that community is because we don't have any idea what's going on behind those closed doors a lot of the times. So a lot, I find that I identify with a lot of business owners, whether they look like me or not, whether they've had the same upbringing with, with me or not. However, there's an outside culture that will believe that, you know, there's biased viewpoints and there's prejudices, mainly because they just couldn't buy a ticket to see that there's programs happening in your favor, there's invitations that you can answer and respond to, there's trainings, there's resources, there's all types of things. Um, so I, 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 I like what you said about the prejudices, but I feel like if there was just a little bit of a discount, we can find that there might not be that many prejudices. One more comment? I, I think several of us have made comments regarding about the importance of, of that personalism or, or of coming closer. And I, I think uh, I've been at so many meetings when there are people running nonprofits and running a church that want to do good, want to do something about poverty. But many times they're not people that are really connected to the community. Their office might be there. But again, it comes back to those relationships that really make the difference and help us to better understand how to make a decision in the work that we want to do. And also, Hopefully, the closer you come to the people you want to serve, you find out it's better served when you're all working on it together, that it's um, not doing something for somebody, but doing something with something and with better understanding for the closer union with the people. Can I share an image of uh, the Reconciliation Center we're involved in? Some of our colleagues set up a program for dads of five and six year olds from working class areas. Dads in working class areas are not seen as people of value. They're not seen as educators, but they desperately want to be seen as that. And this project only takes the dads away with the teachers and some of the senior board of the school and their five and six year olds for two nights. And when they arrive, the dads haven't a clue what to do. Often their heads are low, they're not sure why they came. They came because their partner forced them to come. And two nights later, they are walking around and walking onto the bus with their heads held high because suddenly they are an educator as part of their children's future. That to me is about, you know, everybody has, is a gift and everybody has potential. All right, so, these are the things I've heard, uh, and not in the order I've heard them, this weekend, but doing with others, affordable access into this, um, cultivating spaces of curiosity and dignity, accountability, inclusive invitations into the conversation as well as being in the conversation, I should, cultivating message sharers, personal relationships, meeting the people with needs, and help people meet those who cannot actually meet, um, to create a culture, a space, where what we're talking about is gift, not problem, which makes me ask the question, how do we take that word poverty and make it gift? Okay. But to be seen, as well as heard, and recognized as as people of value. Is that kind of sound? Okay, so I'm going to turn this to the triads. 
You have the same question to name a method. You can also piggyback on things you've heard, but to name those methods. Okay? Anybody have any questions? You have about, there are three people, you have 15 minutes, so you about have the same thing they have, about three minutes each. <laughs> I mean, that we 
you got to be learners first, right? You can't just assume we know the, the situation and all the components and pieces. You know, but it, it takes time to learn. And, and everybody has the, their bits of information. You know, we've been trying to build, um, we, we came up with the Southern Border Relief Network, you know, to, to communicate along, along the border who's doing what and what's going on because, you know, Every group has a little piece of the information. Everyone's situation is different. Right? Like, how do you get the whole picture if you're not getting all those little pieces, right? You know, how do you build a bridge if you don't know the terrain? Uh, you know, if you're going in a rock or sand or whatever. But, but that, that sense that we need to learn before we do. And so often, you know, we just jump into things without doing that. I think for me it would be, don't spend much time with people like yourself. I uh, spend a lot more time listening to people who, are, who have different life experiences than me. So do you become advocates with them for things that they care about? Because they often are the people who are hurt. We're the ones who are hurt. We, we need to listen a lot more. Um, I'm just a late starter to this, but I'm going to try to catch up here. Uh, so the very first thing I think is when you build a bridge, you expect um, travel from both directions. So that's important to note that we're not just building a ladder to lift people out, but we're building a bridge where we're talking about engagement on both sides, right? And so um, I think the idea of venturing, you know, the people who are in this environment who live on one side of the city and never, ever, ever venture to the other side of the city itself. So just basically, when you are kind of dismiss a portion of what can be reaching, um, I think we individually poor. You know, so poverty in itself, you know, it's not just a zero to a hundred scale, zero or a hundred, it has a scale in itself. And when you are feel yourself, uh, dismiss a lot of what is good about other people or other locations, I think everyone suffers. So I think the very first thing we need to address is our own dismissal of um, things that we don't consider valuable. I'd like to uh I'd like to start and go back to the immediacy, right? I think it's important to do something immediately. And when, and when we're thinking about building a bridge, I, I was we're having a conversation earlier in our group about, you know, at, at first I'm thinking, well, we need to build this big bridge that everybody can fit on. And uh, maybe we need to make multiple bridges. It's not just one bridge. Uh, eventually we'll get to the big bridge, right? Uh, so being immediate and being intentional, and then I think also being Having a hard conversation about commu communication, right? I think when we talk about poverty, ten, people tend to shy away from having an honest conversation about there are people living in the neighborhood that are in poverty. And what does that mean? Uh, show was just, a, a, we were talking about this earlier as well, and he said, I don't think, I'm not sure how many of you are living in poverty, but I'm sh sure it's probably not represented in this group, in this, in this meeting here. Uh, that's an assumption, but until we have a conversation about it, it would, it would continue to stay an assumption. But it's important to talk about that and to, to have the conversation about it in order to move forward. So uh, I think to me the first step is really to just do something, right, and start talking. And I think the doing is really about the conversation. Uh, that's why I chose to come, right, to have the conversation. Uh, Okay, so bringing that into consideration, the, the makeup of the room and the non makeup of the room, what are people in poverty talking about? What is their conversation? Is it surrounding bridging or is it surrounding, <coughs> is it surrounding bridging to maybe a higher position or just getting more money? Is it surrounding increasing a world view or figuring out how to get to work? You know, I feel like when, our, when we're having these conversations about building bridges and merging uh, 
building emerging communities out of two different or three different or four different community groups, we kind of figure, we kind of lose that smaller voice that's already not being heard for the sake of the solution. Um, the people in poverty right now, and I raised my hand when she said, I was in poverty, I got $45,000 in student loan debt, it's crippling me. You know, but other people can't pay Section 8 rent, or they don't have bus fare to get across town, or the time it takes to get across town on the bus makes them lose their low wage position. So I feel that there are so many different bridges that we need to build. Figuring out which one to do first has to be the hardest question we can be asked today because tomorrow morning is another day when people have more worries, on top of more worries, and we are taking time to figuring out a order. Am I getting somewhere? Yes. It's like a never ending cycle of solution driving. And we still don't have a room made up of people that we are really trying to engage with. Well, I also think that it's not necessarily a one size fits all, right? So there are people that are living in poverty that have various uh, situations, right? So I've met people and I've worked with people that are waiting. They don't know where they're at. They don't know what city they're in. They don't know when they're going to get their next meal. Uh, that there's other folks that are living in poverty that are worried about how they're going to get their kids to school the next day. So I think there's it's not a, a fit all for everyone. So there's there's situational things that it's hard to say. Well, this is the prescriptive way to get things to. I, don't know, I think we're thinking more about solutions than kind of the process. Uh, but getting back to the process, I think it's it's about having the conversation that there are. What, what I'm learning from it is that there are different, uh, there's not a one size fits all. And you have to meet people where they're at, right? Not where we want them to be or where other people want them to be, but where they want them. Um, sometimes it's hard to think about the next, where you want to be in two years and you don't know where you're going to be tomorrow. I think we all have an individual um, indexes of, indices of what poverty means. And that's poverty, that's what she basically stated. So to create a process or an order, we have to determine. I think my, my idea of poverty is completely different from anyone else's in this room, I can assure you. Because I've seen people in Lagos, Nigeria, where I was born, if you're poor, you basically can don't, don't have any food to eat, right? So it's not a situation here where, you know, two days worth of HEV bread is down to new rents and you're poor here. They, they were like, most of them are well fed. My sister feeds homeless people every Saturday, you know, 250, and you know, some of them reject the food. So that's not, um, so food in some areas is an indication of what poverty is. Here, that's not the case. So you can actually have a job and have a roof over and still feel poor in certain areas. It might be an addiction of some sort. So we, we have to make that determination as to who defines, who, what's that, what's that standard? It can be yours, it can be necessarily mine. And people, I can tell you that I'm poor in some areas. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, but so if we're talking about just well-being, a house, a roof, food, you know, and income, then let's just step over that and then we can address it. But that becomes politics. There, there's been some disastrous bridges. You know, I think a lot of us have heard of, like the, you know, the one in Alaska that just doesn't go anywhere, you know. Um, I went to the school in Ohio, and it was like, <laughs> I was like, quite a But I went, I went to school in Ohio, and right across the bridge was West Virginia, and they were going to build another bridge. So West Virginia is building their half of the bridge. Ohio is building their half of the bridge. They got close, they realized the bridge was not even going to meet. <laughs> I mean, this, this is a true story, true story. Now they had to deconstruct and all that, but, you know, I think for me, that it's kind of like the, the next step that we're talking about. You know, first it's just like, okay, what's, what's the scene? And then it's just like, uh, where are we trying to get to? <laughs> you know, and, and if both sides aren't agreeing, you know, that's not like that. You know, that's what you all are saying. It's just like, okay, those living in poverty, you know, they they have like their goal where they want to get to and they're like, oh we're gonna fix the world for you and this is what we're gonna do for you. And you know, and it just doesn't 
next, you know? And just like, why is this not working? We, we did this for you, and we did that for you. And they're like, uh, you didn't ask for that? That's not what we want. <laughs> That's not helpful. I still can't get the word. Well, I, I think I'm sort of frozen with the idea that, you know, I don't know if there's a mindset of everybody coming together and discovering how to solve poverty, you know, and I, I think there are deeper things. Again, I think it comes back to these relationships, but I think some of the comments like, you know, it's not one size fits all. It's, um, Again, it, everything I think somehow has to be personalized. And again, I emphasize the idea of doing things with people. And in our community center, the people who run the programs today are the people, the person who runs the clothing room needed clothing 50 years ago. The person running the, the lunch line for the homeless grew up with half the people that were coming to the, to the sack lunch program sometimes because it's, it's very community built. And as has been said, there's different levels and people are under the bridge and don't have anything to eat if it's not for some programs like the nonprofits offer. But, you know, I, I was involved in the establishment of Haven for Hope and it has wonderful, wonderful services, but it's not the answer for everything. We try to get every answer inside Haven for Hope, um, but it's still, it's, it's not enough. But what makes it do, do good, I think, is the love and the caring that's at the base and, and the development of relationships with the people who are there. But I think it's overwhelming to try to think, you know, where is that answer? What can we do? Come on, there's a lot of us. We know, you know, we've been working at this for a long time. What can we do? But um, I think we have to be reminded that somehow or other it comes down to our own personal talents uh, of how we can engage the willingness of the community that we may be trying to engage with. It is complicated, and I'm you know, just going to promote the idea that we got to find a lot of creative ideas and it's got to be based through engagement person. Yeah, I'm with you on this. I, I'm not romantic about St. Philip's. So I'm sure it has underbellies like all the institutions, but I think it is a wonderfully transformative college. Because what I've experienced sitting there is many staff who themselves have that hardship in life sitting with students, read stories, read literature, talk about their lives, and find that they're not alone. Not alone because the tutor understands them, they have sat where they have sat, and not alone because they also find other members of the class are on the same struggle and the same journey. So some of it is this notion that a poverty of isolation is overcome for me in some of those wonderful classrooms that students really begin, in a small way, to take off and, and fly their wings because they now know they're not alone. But I think that's a form of poverty that we need to help people over as well. And I only got familiarized with the term since uh, moving to San Antonio from Detroit. I worked with uh, two organizations one of the first was Sam Ministries, and the second one was uh, Workforce Solutions, Alamo, and both of them used the term before their issue, which was either homelessness or unemployment. Um, and the term was chronic, chronic unemployment, chronic homelessness. And that was the term that was defined as the people that kind of want to be there. They used the care options, they uh, denied the additional solutions, and, I, and in my mind, I didn't want to understand it. I didn't want to believe that people would refuse care that can level them up, poverty, or giving them a step forward. And then, and in my business, of course, my motto was, ah, we can define it and we can move past it because that's what you're about to pay me a ton of money to do. And 
Once it worked, but the other time it didn't. So marketing to the chronically under, underemployed, uh, those people that need second chance uh, positions, people that need to be hired without a degree or have been incarcerated or uh, fired for some erroneous reason. You know, those people, those chronically underemployed, as we marketed them, we saw lines around the corner for job fairs as we marketed to those audiences. But when we attempted to engage with the chronically homeless, the people that suffer drug addiction, that uh, had repeatedly been uh, kicked out of apartments, whatever their circumstance may be, we saw little to no trickle in of people available to receive care. And I began to ask the questions of access, one, and then two, feeling like you're alone with it. Feeling like you don't have it, like no one else is seeing your perspective and understanding your point of view and understanding your circumstance. So why get the care? Because it's not what I needed. The unemployed persons saw that we were giving them an in and an open door, whereas the homeless person saw that we were trying to police their situation in order to wave them away from some other
the, one of the best news parts of that is that we are taking a step and we all showed up tonight. That's a step. But when we leave this room, what happens next is the question. So question three, in your conversation circles, agree together upon the necessary first step. What, what do you think? As a community, what could be that next step, a step? And then to concretely and specifically define it, like who might you need to go talk to? What is that thing? When? How immediate? Edward. Yeah. What will it take to put that step number one into working together and collaborative action and addressing this? Now, I've heard something. I've already got an idea, but I'm not sharing. <laughs> but I've been listening, and I think a step has been defined. But we're going to turn that over to the conversation starters. What step, if we were going to really you know, make this night worth it, you've all invested time, and time is one of those most valuable gifts. So what's an important step that could be taken? Now that might be because we have many bridges. And I don't know how many little groups we have here, but if we have 20 little groups, it can be 20 bridges and 20 steps. Not that they all connect to each other. Does that make sense? We're not coming up with one step for the group. But the conversation starters are going to focus on a step. small story. About eight months ago, I went to Mark Savage on the east side, and I was like, all the attention was going to have a burger uh, all by myself. And there was a group of five women there, and they were having a meeting about all kinds of stuff, and I was eavesdropping because, again, whether it was Twitter or just random conversations around me, I'm tuned in. Um, and they were kind of wrong with, like, a lot of stuff. So I began to jump into their conversations, like, no, you know, I want to talk about business, bro. You got to go over here to launch and say, do you want to go? So in a way, they were kind of poor with the amount of information that they had. I just don't have to have a lot of information, so I hooked them up with it, right? Usually, I charge people a lot of money for that. <laughs> a consultation costs like 75 bucks, and people can come in, and I'll just like point them to kind of stuff that I found out since I've lived here only nine years. Fast forward eight months, we've been meeting every Friday at 11.30. And all of the business are open to join. It's called Free Game Friday. And we call it Free Game because we get what in game is like a majority term for like skills and stuff. And so we call it Free Game because we don't charge for our consultations. And no one really believes that all of our information is all of the information. So it's a really great open source opportunity to get insights and scoops and opportunities and whatever it may be, maybe even a couple laughs. And definitely not a free burger because burgers cost ten dollars. But <laughs> it has become our thing that we use to make sure the messaging that we need to pull in and <coughs> our communities is shared to another community, right? And it's our who, it's our what, it's our when. And we don't know what it's going to become, but I know it's something that I invite you all to join in and do, and really encourage you to give away some free game and encourage you to kind of build your own little table. It doesn't have to be a Mark Sauter on the third on Friday, but you know, it could be. <laughs> it's important you decide on what you're doing together. Because we're working together, so just to make sure we're clear on that. <laughs> we're going to do this together. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, I am the Irish one, so I'm only here for a while. I'm old and I'm frustrated in uh, one, we have not really got this goal. But I am really convinced that one contribution would be to create schools where nobody is expelled from. To create places such as schools where everybody has to find a new way of negotiating with one another so that the best for children and young people is fine. That teachers don't have fear, that parents feel safe, that staff feel valued. For me, I would build restorative schools. I would get all the members of the board who come from religious communities or trade unions or humanitarian groups to all buy into this. Why? 
because if you train six and seven and eight year olds to resolve conflicts, to treat one another well, to motivate one another and contribute to one another's well-being, because that's what a restorative school would do. When they become 15, they carry that message. When they become 20 and they fall in love, they carry that message. When they become parents, they then resolve things differently. I personally think that would be one big contribution out of aloneness, out of isolation, and for some people out of poverty. I've seen it work in New Zealand, I've seen it work in Minnesota, I've seen it work in Britain, I've seen it work in Ireland. I just think it would be mind-blowing to give people new ways to live without being conflictual and without scapegoating and being violent to one another, especially in my society. Expelling kids from school, that costs £25,000 a year. How could that money be used differently if it was kept in the school because the school didn't expel anybody? Um, I think we have to decide that every engagement we have um, should necessarily be transactional. And what I mean by that is that when we step out of this space, and the next individual we actually meet, it can be a decision, can have a voice in there that determines whether that individual is uh, worthy of being um, invited into your life or even just even like not being acknowledged at all. So I think poverty, the way we define it, is not necessarily just, it's, to me it's an imbalance. It's not necessarily just homeless or individuals who don't have enough. It's individuals who are holding too much, and that's why I think it works with your um, project, and I thought that as well. Also works in, you know, with the school as well. I think that is something that we need to decide. So it's not just something that we address, it's something that we also address if we don't feel poor in ourselves as well. I just think it's so important to keep mentioning that. So if you are dismissive of something, you are, in a way, um, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it better than, you know, I know that I only discovered, I'll give you an example, I know this is kind of far flung, but I found that that menudo tastes exactly like <laughs> the soup that my grandmother used to cook in my village. <laughs> and the only way I could figure that out was like, you know, that's right. One day, just went out and tried it, and it's exactly that. And I have that every Sunday now. I now found a Nigerian restaurant, so I kind of <laughs> dismissed it a little bit. But it was a great substitute. Now this is thousands of miles away, and when I tell people I have been to the some people go, "Ah, oh, I don't like," you know. It's like, but that is what makes me feel alive. It enriches me. But it's something that for a lot of people might be considered less. <coughs> The idea of venturing is so important. It's so important. When we talk about kids not being like me or the really being open and public access, and you don't, have, there's no way you can find five African American youth walking around the area around the like me and not be challenged and stopped several times. So whether the museum is open and free and it's, they don't have to pay for it, they still can't get that in itself. It's that force field of that we don't see. So poverty, in a way, it's a way, it's kind of an enforced thing for people who are not necessarily poor as well. It's so important to, it's not something that is one-sided, it's, it's an imbalance. I hope that makes sense. I, I think the, you know, there's community organizing groups here in San Antonio that do a lot to, to bring people together and let them speak about, you know, the needs in their community and all those things. And I think such a, a big piece to um, this whole process is like empowering those who are having that need, who have the problem, who need the solution. And so often it's just other people, you know, putting the solution on them. And and what can be done to do that on a on a bigger scale? Because you know a lot of people are afraid of going into unfamiliar situations. 
And am I going to be accepted? You know, will I speak up? Will people, you know, think I'm crazy for speaking up? Or, but you know, how how could those community organizing things be done? You know, on a on a bigger scale so that we're reaching more neighborhoods, or not necessarily we're reaching more neighborhoods, but that more neighborhoods are involved in, in that kind of thing. You know what I mean? And that the they help make those tools for getting to know each other. We don't know our neighbors anymore in so many places. You know, we were talking about the technology, you know, before. You know, everyone used to sit out on their stoop or, you know, on the porch and people, you know, the kids played in the street. And now you have to be at an event or be an activity. And, you know, how, how can we get some of that back and then use that to, to really see, you know, what are the issues in our area? You know, where we live, you know, if you live on the north side, it's going to be different than on the south side. So it's not all going to be the same, but, but you know, to create the atmosphere where people, where everybody has a voice, you know, and it's, and it's easier to say that than to do it, because some of us just have, you know, the answers, right? <laughs> I'm not sure if we, uh, if, uh, we've decided on what our step is, right? I think I'm hearing a couple of different things, but for me, I think personally, I think the step is to just do something, right? So I think we've all committed to doing something and doing something through our networks of things that I can do, right? One, and then being able to circle back with this community and be part of a, a larger coalition or a larger body of being able to say that we're doing something, right? And so I think it's hard to, to put the steps in a chart, be able to explain things. I will tell you that on Thursday, there's gonna be a presentation at City Council about poverty and what the city's plan, and what the city's approach is to be going forward. And I think, uh, you know, I definitely can be part of that. And I think uh, we should probably all see how we can put some synergy and energy behind that, specifically with everybody that we have contacts with, right? So I think just in this small group, we talked about several stakeholder groups and communities that we're part of. How do we influence those communities to, to do what we haven't defined to do yet, but to just commit them to doing it? So, I guess as a personal step, I don't want to create a first step without a room that's engaged with people in poverty. If that's what we're doing here, is trying to deal with that issue. I, I think we, if we, if there's any step, I think we have to figure out how those of us here um, can have this conversation with people in poverty. Okay. And what did the first step be? How are you going to get them in the same way? Well, people need to engage with them on some level. What Figure out them? how you will know them. And there's some of us in this room who know people in poverty, yes. but they're not clear. And, and we need to hear those voices, and I think 
it's invalid to move forward without the voice of the board. We're going to move from here into your conversations. But just so you know, these folks continue to converse, right? When you're conversing, it moves forward. And um, so we're going to talk again for another like 10 minutes. Um, try to be as specific as possible. So you know, like you know what you're going to do when you walk out of this room. And the the thing that I heard in this overall was like engaging the imbalance, and then that community organizing in a way where everyone has voice in rooms that are diverse. And to do that through networks and come back. And then I'm suggesting maybe that the building of circles and like school aspect, those are examples of where that could move into. That's what I'm hearing. But we still don't have like what we got to do in the room, right? So I give you time to talk amongst yourselves. And these folks hopefully are going to like wire that down for themselves. We'd love to hear from others, but we need some like concrete specifics when you come back. <laughs> because I need to feed you and I need to take you to the doctor's appointment. These are decisions that our families are making on a daily basis. But 
on some level, we're not making those decisions. So when we say, let's invite somebody who's really um, experiencing those situations right now, Poverty Simulator is very real and very in-depth. And it takes about an hour to an hour and a half of your time. And I think collectively together, if we could share that experience together, when we're looking at the who, what, when, we would really have a very good platform to execute, to be able to start making decisions on what does that truly look like until you're truly experiencing it and you're making those decisions directly impacting your family in that given situation. We think we have the solutions, but we don't. We don't because we are not in it. We're not living it and we're not making those decisions. So you're suggesting a poverty simulator event or gathering. Another great idea that needs to be shared, wants to be shared. Sister Chan. Well, um, there's an organization that's been in town for almost 50 years. It's called COPS Metro. COPS, the COPS organization is community organizing. It was organized, oh, I don't know how many years ago, in the 60s, I think it's 50 years ago. Actually started in Catholic churches on the west side. And what it does is exactly what we're calling for. It provides an opportunity for people to come together and talk about their needs. Uh, it can be done in homes, it can be done in larger uh, communities, but they, the, the process is established. They train the leaders to work with this. It's, they, they probably put uh, almost half a billion dollars into neighborhood improvements around the city of San Antonio over this time. Do people think, in, in getting organized, they were pretty ruthless in tactics to get the attention <laughs> of leaders, and they're still being blamed for that. However, Tom Frost, and God bless his soul, was converted, his bank was converted, and he, support, he ended up a huge supporter of cops. I suggest that neighborhood groups, church groups, parish groups, Organize groups of other kinds, participate in the process, have leaders trained to facilitate these conversations. It's not, it's already in place. So why don't we use it and not be afraid of it and support it? So that's, I'm going to continue to be a member of Cops Metro and attend their meetings. So a couple of things with that. Um, one, if you have individually or as a collective a great idea, because we're not going to be able to hear tomorrow, uh, I would really like it if you could write that down and give that to me before you leave, because we don't want to lose those things, and we can get that information to everyone. So I do have some uh, index cards if you don't have something to write on, um, and Cynthia's up there too. So if you need a card to write your idea down, just raise your hand and she'll bring that to you. The other thing that I heard listening to this circle, and now I'm listening to the ideas, is that there are many bridges in this room, many bridge builders. So it's, it's not necessarily going to be the one same step, right? Um, but I think the step is to do something. You're going to take a step. You know, we're going to take a step together. Is there like one more great idea that just needs to be shared? I kind of hope it may be one from the center circle, but it doesn't have to be. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Well, I'm really encouraging you to write down those ideas so we don't lose them, and they'll also be going out in information and informing others. So, I'm going to tell you my next step after listening to all of this. So the future conversations that we're having in this four-part series, uh, the next one's March 31st, and it's entitled Changing the Landscape. Um, and I, it, it's going to flow really nice, I think, after this one. Um, it will be 6.30 to 8.30, just like this. I don't know where yet, um, but it's starting to develop in my head. Um, so my invitation is this. And this is the step I'm going to take. So it's going to sound familiar because I've been listening. 
I didn't have this fit before, right? But that we do leave this space and intentionally meet people and see them for who they are. So to be awake, right? And engaging. And try to get to know someone at least. Or to appreciate the someones you already know. Right? And uh, to continue to involve uh, the networks that I know as well in this process. And I want to invite all of you to work with me to come back on March 31st with your someone's new friends, the people you now know, so that we can learn together on how to change the landscape, literally, of our city when it comes to poverty and our geography and how we're dealing with each other. That we need to be learning from each other. So that's, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna work towards that. And you don't have to limit how many people you bring to one someone. And so I know what that means with Patty. So she's gonna fill the room. <laughs> what are the rest of you gonna do, right? Seriously. So that's what I'm inviting you into. Um, so in closing, because it's 828, um, I want to respect your time. Uh, three things. Um, email. If you aren't getting the news we can use each week from the Faith-Based Initiative, and you would know what I was talking about if you do, if you don't, I would encourage you to give us your email. Um, and Cynthia can take that as well, again, on a card or a scrap piece of paper, because it will keep you informed and also getting that information. But it will keep you informed about the next gathering on March 31st. Um, on your chairs, you receive a very fancy, professional-looking Word document <laughs> in white, right? Um, but a menu of meaning. So perhaps tomorrow or tonight, there's an area that you're already very interested in working on. Um, this is up-to-date information of areas of concern and bridge building and work that's going on in the community, um, how it relates to poverty, things that are happening, but also two contact names, one within the community and one within the city structure. So if you or your congregation or organization want to get involved, you have somebody that you can go to. So that's what that menu is for. It's for you to be about the work. And um, we always have a table and a space in terms of our resources. So next time you come, if you want to bring a flyer or a brochure or something that you want to let people to find out about, um, there's a few of those on the table by the exit. But I really want to mention Sacred to you, the San Antonio Community Resource Directory, because it's already doing that work of connecting community with the needs and the resources. So uh, if you don't know about it, Keith is over there. He's going to wave his hand, and you can stop and talk to him about that. But it's a free online uh, resourcing directory. And, and donations. Oh, yeah, it could use money. But like, we all can. And I'm just going to ask, I'm going to put Edward on the spot at 8.30. Uh, he just moved to his new position on January 15th. So uh, I'm going to put him is it true that in neighborhood and housing services that they're working on an effort, and I don't know this for sure, um, that they're working on an effort to bring together all the neighborhood association leadership and do some work with them? Am I right? Do you know? Yes. Oh, okay. Do you know details? Um, sure. Because I think it relates to what we've been talking about. So we're trying to gather input from existing neighborhood associations that have registered with the city of San Antonio to gather input about framing some policy around how to create boundaries. Uh, I think there's some, uh, there is recently been some discussion. I think we haven't had this problem in the past where there's a neighborhood, there's a neighborhood association and that boundary is set. But uh, most recently there's been some uh, instances where people that either are not unaware of the neighborhood boundary or want to create a new neighborhood boundary 
about what's the process to create another neighborhood boundary or a separate that overlap. And right now we're trying to see how do we do that? How do we, what's the best approach for, for that? So we're trying to get input from uh, neighborhood associations of the community on how we address that. And so there's not a, a clear kind of well, exists. The, the way the code works now is if you're a registered uh, association with the boundary, then that's the name of it, right? We don't govern what that is. We just uh, we're the keeper of record. Uh, but there is some discussion on how do you how do you uh, how do we deal with that instance and we are trying to get some input on, on that. I'm thinking neighborhood associations would be a great place to create community where you couldn't tell where the boundaries are. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think the other thing is it's really it's really a great communication tool, right? So the, there's uh, we we're utilizing it in you know obviously for things that are important for their community that, that they live close to. So if you have a zoning case or if you have uh, something in the development code, you you get notified. But it's also a community we had a series of homeless community input meetings that one's happening tonight, I think. Or last every night, night, every night, every night this week, and we send that out to all of the people that are registered in that community uh, registry. So it's a great communication tool. Uh, we're trying to make it so that it's two way, but at this point it's one way. Mm -hmm. And how many approximately neighborhood associations are there? So there's a little over 300, but there are, we know that there's close to a thousand that are next door. So. so think about if if we were to really like strategically think about that, what could happen? So. And yes, I, sir. We need to close I, I know you need to close I'm not going to say much, except we met. The Neighborhood Leadership Academy met last Tuesday. Oh. It would have been nice if they'd been invited here tonight. Yeah. You I, can do that next time. Yeah, How many were there? 80. Wow, see, so Patty's filling this room. You're bringing 80 next time. <laughs> I'm getting a bigger space, okay? Thank you all for coming.